It is so good to worship together, isn't it? I mean, man, what a, what a joy. Praise God. Hey, my name's Ryan. I'm one of our pastors here, and just a joy to be with you today. If you're joining us online, a special welcome to you also. Um, my family and I enjoyed watching uh, portions of the Olympics this summer. We didn't watch a ton of it, but what we did watch, we enjoy. Anybody else enjoy watching the Olympics? Every four years, we care about sports we don't even remember existed um, a few months before, right? Uh, one of... One of uh, my favorite moments of the Olympics was when the mom from Australia just absolutely dominated the women's breakdancing. Okay, maybe she didn't dominate women's breakdancing, but she won the internet, didn't she? I mean, like brought, she made me think, you know, maybe the Olympics is not out of sight for me. This, I believe, is the kangaroo, right? Um, in all honesty, though, one of my favorite uh, moments was when Noah Lyles won the men's 100. I don't know if you caught this, but it was such a close finish. They had to go to the photo finish, and he thought that he had finished second, and he went over to somebody, congratulated them, thought they took the gold, and then saw his name pop up and was like, so, sorry, bro, but yes, right? <laughs> like, it reminded me of a, a study that I read um, a little while back. Two Cornell professors did this study, and they wanted to analyze uh, which medal winners were the happiest. So they used the 1992 Olympics as sort of their test case. Um, gold, silver, bronze. Uh, which medal winner is the happiest? Bronze. Happiest. <laughs> gold. <laughs> gold. Um, Second happiest is? Okay, so spoiler, um, it's actually bronze. The bronze medalist is the second happiest medalist standing on the podium, third happiest. And they did this, uh, they an analyzed sort of uh, facial expressions and body posture to figure this out. And the data was overwhelming that bronze medalists were happier than silver medalists. Can you imagine standing on a podium being honored as the second best in the world at something and being disappointed. You know, it's interesting, if we were to sort of just go around and do a survey and, and I were to ask you individually, would you rather finish in second place or third place? All of us would say, I'd rather finish in second place. Second place is better than third. Unless you think, oh, I was this close to first. And it turns out that gap of I was this close to first is the contentment gap. It's the happiness gap. It's the gap that makes us go, this was one of the best races of my life to, oh, if I had just done a little bit better. And I'm convinced that our expectations um, and our perspective on life shape our contentment way more than our circumstances do. There's a Jewish family in Hungary that was, um, they, they were poor and they went to their rabbi and they said, listen, rabbi, there are nine of us living in one house together. We are miserable. What should we do? And the rabbi says, um, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go get your goat and I want you to bring your goat into the house with you. And then I want you to come back in a week. And the guy looks at his rabbi and goes, Rabbi, I don't know if you heard me correctly. It, the problem is our house is too crowded. We have nine of us in one room and you want us to bring a goat inside? He goes, just do it and come back in a week. The guy says, okay, I'll do it. And he goes and he brings a goat inside and it goes about as well as you would imagine. He comes back in a week and his rabbi goes, so how to go? And the guy goes, terrible. We have a goat in our house now. Thank you very much. It's absolutely miserable. And the rabbi says, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the goat out of your house, come back in a week. And the guy comes back in a week, meets with his rabbi and his rabbi goes, so how'd it go? He goes, oh man, life is good, man. <laughs> never been, never been better. There's only nine of us in this room. No goat, no problem, right? And I think it shows us how easy it is to move from content to discontent or from discontent back to content. The gap between your expectations and your reality is the place where it's so hard to find contentment. I think that's true for every single one of us. 
It's that gap between we thought that our marriage was going to flourish and then it fell apart. We thought the stocks were just going to keep going up and to the right and then they fell off the cliff. We thought our kids were going to follow Jesus and when they got out of our house, they walked away from our church, the church and they won't even talk to us anymore. It's that gap between what we expect and what we experience and the difference where it's so hard to find contentment. See, I think most of us, we can be content when our circumstances line up and we're praising God, thank you, Jesus, for the way that you've blessed and life is good and it's great. Man, it's sort of easy to be content then. But is there a way to be content when it feels like life is falling apart? Is there a way to be content that's like an anchor for our soul when the storms of life start to rage? That's what this passage is all about. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter four. As we finish our summer series in this letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. He wrote it from a Roman jail back to a church that he loves dearly. And in the last section of this great letter, he's going to mention rejoicing once again. Remember, he mentions that 16 times in this letter. And he's going to write to them about contentment. So just imagine Paul on house arrest writing about contentment. Starting in verse 10 of chapter 4. Are you there? Yes. Right on. Here we go. It says this. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly now that at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Like you, you weren't able to put into practice the fact that you were thinking about me and that you cared about me. But now you can. Verse 11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned. In whatever situation I am to be, what? Content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any, everybody say any. any. And every, everybody say every. every. Circumstance I have learned, say learned. learned. The secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and in need. Uh, this word contentment was a word that the Stoic philosophers of Paul's day absolutely loved. In fact, they said that this was the paramount, sort of the pinnacle of living a life of virtue and wisdom. They define contentment, and contentment is defined as being self-sufficient. So for the Stoic, the content life was the life where you had everything within yourself that you need in order to survive and thrive. A content country would be a country that doesn't need any outside resources in order to be sustained. It's got everything it needs within itself. And Paul's going to go, listen, contentment is a really, really good thing. I just want to offer you a wildly different pathway to arriving at this goal. Here's his pathway. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Literally, the verse reads, I have strength through or in the one who is strengthening me. So here's Paul's new vision. He says, listen, you don't have what it takes in and of yourself to live a life of contentment. That's the bad news. You don't have the resources that you need in order to thrive, just you. You don't have the love that you need, just looking inside. You don't have the wisdom, just looking inside. You don't have the resources within yourself. Paul's sort of anthem is not, look deeper within and you'll find everything you need. No, he goes, listen, I can live content when I live through Christ. He goes, that, that's my contentment. It doesn't come from myself. Um, what Paul's saying is that there's this movement from being self-sufficient to being God-dependent that is the essential ingredient to the life of contentment. In fact, I'd invite you to write it down like this today. Intimacy with Christ, walking with Christ is the secret to contentment in life. It's the through Christ life that Paul says is the secret to contentment. I mentioned last week that my uh, family and I, we had the great opportunity to go to Kauai this summer. Uh, my in-laws took us there and it was just awesome. 
And if you've ever been to Kauai, you know that it's just filled with natural beauty. Like everywhere you look, you're like, oh my goodness, you've got to be kidding me. Like just every corner of that island is gorgeous. And one of the things we loved doing was um, going and checking out different waterfalls. Uh, this is a picture of Waialua Falls, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. And the water runs like that off of that waterfall, like every day, all day, all year. And we were standing there going, Where, where's all this water coming from? I mean, it rains a lot in Kauai, in some places of Kauai, but it doesn't rain enough to feed all that. And so my wife, whenever like, we ask this question of like, where does that come from? She's like, on Google, like, I will figure this out, right? Like, I love that about her. She's just curious. And, and so it turns out that this waterfall is a combination of rain, certainly, but that's not where most of the water comes from. Most of the water for this waterfall comes from under and within the earth and it springs out and that's what feeds this waterfall. It's a source that's, that's hidden, that, that you can't see on the surface and that you, even if you went back to its beginning, you wouldn't necessarily be even able to discern where it was coming from. I think that Paul is saying the same thing. The secret is the source. The secret is the source. The secret to contentment is the source from which you draw from in your life. And you can either draw from your own self or you can say, I don't have it within me to provide everything. I need a different source. And Paul goes, oh, that's the secret. When he is your source, you can live content in any situation. But I think even within sort of... Um, uh, disciples circles and circles of those who follow Jesus, there's misconceptions about contentment. So let me share with you three misconceptions about contentment, even that some Jesus followers have. And then I wanna share with you four affirmations that we can make um, in light of the through Christ life. Here's the first misconception. The first misconception about contentment is that contentment means that Jesus helps me win. I'm content. Because Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I remember when Tim Tebow uh, was just dominating college football. In 2009, he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And on his eye black, he had Phil 4.13. And I thought, that's awesome. Like, to give God the glory on uh, Sports Illustrated is just great. Um, my, my question for Tim would be like, what do you mean by I can do all things? Like, do you mean I can win this game through Christ who strengthens me? I can win the Heisman Trophy through Christ who strengthens me. I can win the national championship through Christ who strengthens me. And if that's what you mean, what if the other quarterback also has Phil 413 on his eyes? Like, how does Jesus decide who he's going to strengthen to win the game, if that's what we mean? See, I think that uh, Tim Tebow can write Phil 413 on his eye black as long as it means even if I lose this game, my identity is unshakable because it's not in myself, it's in the one who calls me his son. Yeah. See, Phil 413 isn't saying you can do anything that you put your mind to. It's saying that you can have contentment in any situation you find yourself in because you are not the source he is. When I was uh, um, growing up in high school, I grew up in the youth group era of the power team. Anybody with me? Okay, awesome, yeah. And so the power team would come around to different youth groups and there would be these guys that were like really strong and they would do demonstrations like tearing phone books in half. And if you missed out on this, I just wanna say you missed out like big time. <laughs> And they would be like, you know, hey, like Philippians 4.13, I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. And they'd be like, tear the phone book in half. And I, I was like, wow. And I went home and I'm like, hey, mom, I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. Give me that phone book, right? And I'm like, Ugh, uh. like evidently the verse applies differently when you're yoked like that than when you look like this. So maybe that's not what the verse means. <laughs> In this context, Paul's talking about contentment in losing as much as in winning. Here's the second misconception. Second misconception 
is that contentment through Christ is a great backup plan when circumstances fail. <laughs> like, yeah, contentment through Christ, that's awesome when life is going really bad. But when life is going great, we want to find contentment in those circumstances. I think it's really poignant that Paul writes to the church and he says, I've learned to be content in every situation when I abound and when I'm well fed, even then my contentment comes through Christ. Here's what I found you guys. It is so easy to think that your contentment is in Christ, but when your world starts to fall apart, what you realize is, oh, it was actually in my circumstances. And sometimes we don't know that we've built contentment in our circumstances until our circumstances start to fail. And it's in those moments that there's this gracious invitation of Jesus calling us back saying, actually, there is an anchor that runs deeper. There is a hope that holds stronger. There is a love that's better. I can be your source. Third misconception. Contentment means that we're happy with every part of our life. There's a saying that's, uh, it's an old pithy statement. It's been around forever. And it, it goes like this. Contentment isn't having what you want. It's wanting what you have. Which sounds really good. But what happens when we don't want what we have? Like, just bring a goat inside and then you'll be content. <laughs> like, what if that doesn't work? Like, like, and I, I don't think Paul's going to say, listen, like you should be happy about having cancer or you should be happy about walking through the divorce. But I think he is saying that there is a way, a deeper source to where you can be content even when you aren't happy or excited about every little detail going on in your life. In fact, your contentment is not, as a, as a Jesus follower, your contentment is not about what you have. It's about who you trust and where you abide. Let me say it again. As a Jesus follower, your contentment is not found in what you have, your circumstances or your situation. It is found in who you trust and it is found in where you abide. And Paul says, I've learned the secret and the secret is the source. And because of that, there's some things that he's going to say about his life that we too, when we live the through Christ life, that we too can echo with Paul. And I've designed these to be sort of affirmations. And my hope and prayer has been that like one or two of these just stand out to you. And you decide, I'm going to put that on a post-it note and put it on my mirror in my bathroom or on the center of my steering wheel in my car so that I remember it and that this truth can sink down deep inside of me. So four affirmations about contentment in the through Christ life. Here's the first. Paul said this. He said, I can do how many things? All things. He doesn't say, listen, um, I'm content when my circumstances align. He has this unwavering confidence, almost this ridiculous confidence that he could be content anywhere, doing anything. And I think it would benefit us to say, like, what kind of person could have that kind of audacity? Anything, Paul? <laughs> like, anything, but luckily, we know part of Paul's journey before he wrote this letter. Let me share with you a little bit about what Paul has been through. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, listen to what he wrote. He said, I've been in prison with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Three times? The brother's getting back on the boat. People are like, hey, aren't you the guy that's been shipwrecked twice? Like, <laughs> let's pace down and go by land, right? Three times I've been shipwrecked, a night and a day adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. The dude was in a lot of danger. In toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all the other things, there was the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. I can do all things. 
I say that to say Paul is a credible source. It's like listening to Viktor Frankl write about hope. He's a, he has walked through the valley of the shadow, beating, stoning, shipwrecks, physical danger, sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, emotional pressure. And he says, listen, I can live content in any of that. Bring it on. And I think if you were to sort of like peel back the parts of the onion, what you'd find underneath that affirmation is what he already said in chapter 1, verse 21. For, for me, Paul said, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That kind of affirmation makes you untouchable. I mean, your enemies are like, well, we're going to kill you. He's like, awesome. Go be with Jesus. And he's like, well, then we're going to let you live. And he's like, awesome. Then I'm going to serve Jesus. And they're like, how do we take this guy down? Put him in prison. He goes, oh, I can be content there. And here's his affirmation that, that you can echo also because you also live the through Christ in Christ life. He is your source also if you are a follower of Jesus. You can say, I can thrive in any situation. And I use the word thrive because when Paul writes about contentment, it goes way beyond just survival. But he says, I can thrive. I've, I've long been fascinated with, I don't know if it's a sport, but we'll call it a sport today, with the sport of free diving. Like people that dive deep down into the ocean without any gear on. I've, I've been um, fascinated with it because I think they're crazy. But um, <laughs> here's what I want you to do. If you have a paper out, I want you to just write on your notes um, how far down you think you could dive before you had to come back up, okay? How far down do you think you could go? And then I want you to write how, how long you think you could hold your breath underwater, okay? All right, how far down do you think you could go? Um, anybody have um, more than 10 feet down? Anybody think you could get more than 15 feet down? More than 20 feet down? Okay, um, what about holding your breath? Uh, raise your hand if you think you could hold your breath more than 30 seconds, more than a minute, more than two minutes. Okay, you can put your hands in. This is fascinating. Did, did you know that the deepest free dive ever recorded was done by a man named Herbert Nisch? And he dove down uh, with the assistance of weights on him and a rope. He dove down in the ocean 813 feet. The longest anybody has ever held their breath underwater, 11 minutes and 35 seconds. I tell you this so that you look back at the numbers you wrote down on your piece of paper, <laughs> and now you have some life goals, all right? No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. I don't, I don't suggest either of this. I, what, I, what I am suggesting is that you're capable of way more than you think. What I am suggesting is that when you live through Christ and when he is your strength, you can actually thrive anywhere. You're capable of more than you think. And some of you have an image of your head of like, this could happen where it would derail me and it would take me down. Like if this relationship ended or if the finances didn't go the way that I think they, want, that they should or I want them to or the divorce goes through or the mental health doesn't seem to go in the right direction or this pain doesn't subside, well then I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. I want you to know if you are in Christ, you can thrive anywhere when he's your source. You can echo what Paul said, I can do all things. See, when you walk with Jesus, you can walk through anything. And I just, want, I just want to speak over you today that I'm convinced you're capable of more than you know. Because his power is at work in you. And for Paul, I think this is a movement from victim. Like, you read through that list of all the things that Paul went through, and it would be so easy for him to just be absorbed in all the stuff that's happened. It's a movement from victim to victor. That's the mind shift. Here's the second thing that Paul says. Verse 14, he says, Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you. 
You think this church is close to Paul's heart? Absolutely. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Paul's already said that this church is deep in his heart. He has an affection for them that runs deep. And so even on house arrest in Rome, in some ways, isolated and away from the churches that he planted and the people that he loves, he has this sense, even though I'm lonely, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. In fact, he says that this church is sharing in his trouble, like they've entered into his pain with him. So he has this affirmation that you can say also, if you're in Christ, I am not alone. I'm not alone. Some of the most encouraging moments for me over the last few months have been when people who are close to me or people that sort of had my itinerary of things that I was doing over sabbatical would reach out and say, I'm praying for you. One guy who's a good friend of mine had my itinerary and before I went on trips, like the day before I would leave, each trip he would send me a text, I'm praying for you. After the second one, I knew, oh, he's following along. He's, he's tracking with me. He didn't just say he's going to pray for me. He's he's praying for me. He's entered in with me. And I I can't tell you how encouraging that was for me, to know that there was somebody with me in the midst of these things that I was asking God to do in my life. And he's going, I'm going to hold up your arms in prayer. I had a few friends like that over the course of the last few months, and they were so encouraging to me. I don't know if Paul's able to say, I can be content in any and every situation if he doesn't have other followers of Jesus around him. And I don't know if you can either. See, part of Jesus being the source is him providing for our needs through the people that he has seated around us. And I love that Paul doesn't just stop at his emotional needs that people step into as challenging as that would be. I mean, they're, they're literally, they are sharing in his sufferings, stepping into his place of need. We call it empathy. But not only that, listen to how he continued. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your account, meaning there's something God does in you as you step in and are generous with others. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to whom? God. Meaning these gifts that you gave me, Paul said, actually were gifts to God. They weren't directly to me. They were worship. I mean, whenever you give to Emmanuel Faith, you give to other nonprofits that are moving the gospel forward, it is a gift to God, not to that organization and not to that church. It's a fragrant offering to him, Paul says. It's not just meeting the physical needs of the people around you, although it is that also. And that's one of the ways that it's so encouraging. It's this mind shift from isolation to community. I'm not alone. So on the first Sunday of every month, we take our care fund offering here at Emmanuel Faith. And Emmanuel Faith, you are one of the most generous churches that I have ever heard of. So that, yeah, praise God. So that um, a few weeks ago, there was a single parent in our church body who was going through a really challenging time. They lost a job unexpectedly, had kids they needed to take care of, and didn't know where the finances were going to come from. So they reached out to the church and said, is there any way that you can help bridge this gap between I lost my job and I need another job in order to provide for my family? And we said, absolutely. Because of your generosity, we could say yes. So we were able, you were able to step in and to meet the needs that this single parent had for a season. They're now back on their feet, got another job, They're able to provide once again for themselves, but you were able to help pay their rent, to help give gas for their car in order to go look for jobs and in order to give them food in that season where they didn't have enough. You were the church for that person. And praise God. And here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to know. If this is your church home and these are your people, you are never alone. 
You're never alone. And I want, please, if there's a need you have, we can't help meet it if we don't know about it. Please reach out. If there's a need you see that you can meet on your own, step into it faithfully. This is part of the joy of following Jesus. The reason that we had a Find Your People pizza party, the reason we have a fall launch, the reason we're inviting you to get in life groups and to find support groups is so that you can confidently say, I am not alone. I'm not alone. And it's one of the ways that we can say, gosh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because he strengthens me through the people who are sitting right next to me right now. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we've learned we can thrive anywhere. We are not alone. And listen to what Paul says next. He says, and my God will supply how many needs? All. All. Every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Somebody say, amen. amen. Now, um, Paul isn't saying that we won't have any needs. In fact, in order for God to supply our needs, um, there would, it would presuppose that there are needs present. <laughs> And he isn't saying that God will always supply all of our needs in the timeline that we think he should. That's where so God and I sometimes have a disagreement. <laughs> what he is saying is that God will supply every need that we have so we can say, I am sufficiently supplied. Listen, you guys, uh, the psalmist would say in Psalm chapter 50, verse 10, that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. It's his way of saying every resource is ultimately his. The psalmist will say God is in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. That means that when he wants to channel one of those um, thousand cattle, a th cattle on a thousand hills to you, he can do it. Nothing has ever tied his hands. Nothing has ever made him go, well, I really wish I could bless Paulson in this way, but I just can't bless him. He's never thought that. And I think if we, if we can get that in our heads, God's able to do whatever he wants. He has every, resources at, every resource at his disposal. Man, the world starts to look a lot different. There's this mind shift from, from a scarcity mentality to an abundance mentality. But part of the issue is trusting that God knows what I need. As some of you are, are longing for a relationship or you're longing for a living situation to be changed and to be different. And you're going like, God, these are, these are needs that I have that are very real right now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm reminded that sometimes God and I disagree about what my needs are. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes I think it's a need and he evidently doesn't. Because if God doesn't give it, I must not need it. And I'm learning to trust that he knows what I need. And I'm learning to trust that he is in fact trustworthy and loves me more than I could ever imagine. But I've just got to be honest, this is a journey for me. But here's the truth, you guys. Here's the truth. Really? What any of us really need has already been given because what we ultimately really need is salvation from our sin and it's been provided his name is Jesus what we ultimately need is to be reunited with the God who created us and loves us and that has been given his name is Jesus what we really need is to know that even on our worst day we are loved and cared for and seen by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's been done. His name is Jesus. What we need to know is that there's nothing that we could ever do and there's nothing in creation that could separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What you ultimately really need, you already have. His name is Jesus. That's why the... Great hymn says, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance right now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart, high king of heaven, my treasure. You're my treasure. You're my source. 
thou art. And when he's your treasure, you always have enough because you always have him. One final affirmation. And um, I, I love the end of Philippians because if you look at your own Bible and you look at verse 20, like you would think that's the end. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Like, that's usually the way you sign off. So next time you think, hey, Paulson, you had two endings to that sermon. I just remember I'm in good company, man. Like Paul's a preacher. He's like, amen. And then I got a few more points, right? Listen to his final, final point. <laughs> greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Now, to us, this might seem like a, just a throwaway ending. Um, sincerely, the Apostle Paul. I would suggest to you that when the church in Philippi read this final passage in the letter that Paul wrote them, that the hair on their arms stood straight up. That there was a tingle that ran down their spine. That they whispered around in the circle, wait, there's a, there's a church in Caesar's? house like that's where this thing is going like Caesar who's worshipped all over the Roman Empire where people bow and claim he is God and unbeknownst to him he's hosting I get chills thinking about it right now. he's hosting a church no way no way the original readers must have been absolutely shocked the seeds of a revolution that in roughly 300 years would be more powerful than the empire itself are being cultivated right under the roman emperor's nose in his house you guys this thing is unstoppable it's unstoppable and i think what it, hopefully is an encouragement to you and to me this morning is the affirmation that we get to say we are part of a bigger story. And contentment never comes if we just look at our own lives. We need to zoom out to see the bigger picture that God is at work, that his plan is unstoppable, even when it looks like the opposition is way more powerful, the pain is way more prevalent, the hurt is way more strong, the healing is feeling like it's insurmountable. There's a church in Caesar's house. The seeds of the revolution are being sown in the darkness, in the hurt, in the pain, in the enemy's territory. And the mind shift that you and I get to make is one from looking at our lives through a microscope to pointing a telescope up to go, God, there's a bigger story that you're telling. And my life might hurt right now. And this situation, I don't need to pretend like it's great and play mind games with myself. It is really, really difficult. But there are ways that you're at work and there are things that you're doing and your power is moving forward in ways I may not be able to put my finger on right now, but I know it's happening. How do I know? There's a church in Caesar's household. I had a friend who went to Croatia over the summer and she was telling me at, at our writing team, we meet every Wednesday this week about going to visit um, the Roman emperor Diocletian's palace. Diocletian was emperor from 284 to 305. And in 303, he issued an edict of persecution against Christians. And his mission was to wipe out every Christian and specifically to do away with every single Bible. And he thought that he had burned the last Bible. And so he built a monument on top of the ashes of that Bible that said extincto nomine Christianorum, which means the name Christian is extinguished. It's done. 
Well, spoiler alert, he was wrong. And if you were to go to Croatia today and you were to visit Diocletian's palace, what you would find there is a church, one of the oldest churches in the world. And you could go to one of the temples he built to one of the lowercase g gods that he worshiped. And in that former temple, you would find a baptismal. And I love that picture, you guys, because I don't know what you're walking through today. And I don't know what you bring in these doors. And I don't know what kind of pain is in your life for you to say, I'm not sure how I could live content in this. And I I just want to say, I get it. I get it. I'm not up here waxing eloquent saying life's always going to be perfect. It's always up and to the right. It's always going to be good. No, what I'm saying is there is an anchor that can hold you deeper. God is at work in ways you could never imagine, you could never see. And I want to remind you that you can make it and thrive in any situation, that you are not alone that you have everything you need in Christ Jesus and that you are part of a bigger story that he is telling and he promises that he will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He will not let you go. See, unshakable contentment is found in an unstoppable God. There's a church in Caesar's house. And there are seeds of the kingdom of God being planted in your pain right now, in your shame right now, in your guilt right now. He is at work. And the invitation is, will you trust that source as the source of your contentment? Friends, the secret is the source. His name is Jesus, and he will never let you go, and he will never run dry, and he will always be enough, always. Let's pray. Just give you a moment, catch your breath a little bit. Which one of those four affirmations do you need to write on a post-it note and stick somewhere so you remember it? All of them, okay, fair. Maybe you just ask the spirit, which one one of those do I just need to be reminded of? Jesus, thank you for being the source that we can live strengthened in and through the one strengthening us, content in any situation. Lord, I pray that uh, over my friends in this space, for those who are in a really good season of life right now, would you remind them that their contentment isn't in the great season, it's in the giver of the seasons. For those that are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, would you remind them that there's an anchor that holds deeper? Jesus, thank you for the reminder today that the secret is the source, that you are our contentment. And so we cling to you, we trust you, we abide in you. Would your power so powerfully work in us so that we would be able to echo with Paul, I can do all things. Well-fed, hungry, abounding, or in need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me.